Good morning, everybody. Quick, uh, quick note, we are going to be starting here in a couple of minutes, so please try to find your seats uh, and we'll get started.
Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Please find your seats. We'll get started here in about 30 seconds. Uh, welcome to day one of our fall summit. Uh, first and foremost, a few housekeeping items, though. Uh, if you'll check your brochure, check the back of your badge, you'll have our uh, access to our event app. And in that, you'll find the full lineup of startups, as well as some voting features, uh, which we are going to ask you all to participate in towards the end of the session. So we've got a great lineup today of startups from our batch three for the supply chain and logistics program. Um, we are going to be turning it over to Mike Z here in a second. Um, other quick items to consider would be the Brella networking app. So please do take a look. There are going to be other organizations, other investors, and other startups that are going to be participating in that. Um, and it's a pretty easy way for you to pick someone up in the back uh, during our break sessions or later on throughout the day. Uh, so with that being said, I'd like to turn over to Michael Zank. Thank you, Harvey. Welcome, everyone, to our new uh, Expo Fall Summit Center. Uh, we normally host, obviously, in, in Sunnyvale, so look forward to hearing everyone's feedback. We are doing some renovations at our other facility. Um, so, so I'll talk to you just very briefly before we get to the stars of the show, the startups, uh, about our program. Uh, for me, this is a very exciting program, uh, having just started it 18 months ago. Uh, we had the vision of becoming the world's leading program for the digital transformation of end-to-end -end supply chain. So as you can see, we're working with partners all the way from uh, chemical companies to oil and gas to uh, steel, mining, uh, all the way to the end of the supply chain where uh, items are delivered at, at the doorstep to someone's home. Uh, so a trend we see across the industry is that a lot, there needs to be a lot of collaboration across the supply chain that large corporations and kind of key players in the supply chain need to work together to be able to properly uh, pilot and work with new technologies or startups. So that was kind of the vision of our program and, and uh, I, I definitely think we've succeeded in building the world leading program for supply chain and logistics innovation. Uh, just looking at the partners, and thank you all for coming here and supporting us. Uh, the largest maritime companies like Mayor sitting here in the front. Uh, the okay. there we go. The the largest uh, rail companies. Uh, the majority of the class one railroads across North America are all here. Uh, we we have the largest uh, trucking companies, air cargo with with FedEx, DHL, Lufthansa Cargo, uh, warehousing obviously. We want to not just talk about their traditional relationships in the industry, but really work on these new innovations across the supply chain. So, uh, so today we we is kind of the conclusion of or the uh, graduation for the startups we accepted into batch three of this program. This is the process that we go through. So we've selected an industry leader, kind of from each part of the supply chain. TJX being a leading retailer, uh, Prologis being the largest uh, warehouse owner. Uh, DHL being the largest logistics company, so they can select the startups uh, to be, become part of this program. We reviewed thousands of startups with our team worldwide to be accepted. We sent top 100 lists to our, our corporate partners uh, who then met the startups in person at our selection day where 35 startups uh, presented. And now 22 startups have been selected. We gave them all the resources, introductions uh, that Plug and Play can provide. And uh, we put them through this program. And a lot of them have done pilots with the, the, the corporate partners. A lot of them have had major successes. Project 44, for example, uh, just raised $50 million, which is <laughs> pretty incredible. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, kind of meaningful relationships and, and large, not just pilots, but meaningful implementations uh, through some of our startups that have happened throughout the program. Uh, so this is what I, I, I really like this year is kind of uh, that we became a very global program. We're not just here in Silicon Valley, but we have people who flew in worldwide uh, to participate today. Uh, this is just a representation of the startups that we reviewed for this program that made it onto our top 100 list. As you can see, 
Uh, a lot of them are in U.S., about half of them, but we really have startups that we're looking at all over the world uh, through using Plug and Play's global network. The offices, or the, the dots you can see in white, those are actually new supply chain offices that we have people on the ground working to uh, work with corporate partners that, for example, can't make the trip to Silicon Valley. Uh, so we, we launched an office in Berlin. Uh, for recovering European market. Uh, we launched an office in China, if you're very focused on the Chinese market, and also Singapore focusing on the rest of the Asia Pacific region. So we now have four kind of offices that, that we're really continuing to build this ecosystem. Uh, I, I'm very excited. Uh, in 2018, we've really, as a, on the not only on the startup side, but on the corporate side, we've also gone very global. We have partners flying in today, like JD.com, who you'll hear from shortly from China, uh, who joined us, uh, Yamato, uh, who's been a very active partner coming from Japan, who you'll also hear from. Uh, very excited to have L'Oreal, just joined very recently uh, to the as an ecosystem member in the program, who's already engaged in a number of uh, deal flows, obviously a French company working with their New York office. Uh, very excited to announce Ryder uh, as, as one of the newest anchor partners, as we want to get a leading trucking company as an anchor partner. Uh, the, having them kind of work with us for the first year and become an anchor was really great. And then uh, TJX, who was actually a retail partner for two years at Plug and Play, uh, just upgraded or just uh, also joined as an anchor partner in supply chain. Uh, Kansas City Southern, who also became an Ecosystem Plus member instead of an Ecosystem member, and then uh, Brass Scam, who just joined, who's one of the largest petrochemical companies in the world and leading company uh, in Brazil, coming all the way from Brazil. So it's really cool to have everyone fly here, to have this the one kind of meeting place worldwide uh, for the kind of industry to gather and work on these innovations. And here's a video of the Prologis CEO who just uh, did an event with us the other week. Today, uh, e-commerce represents about 10% of uh, total retail sales in the U.S., uh, more in some emerging economies, actually. And I think that it's going to grow to a much bigger percentage, and more and more categories of retail are now going online. So I think it's a business that it's in its infancy, and the runway is very long, and we're very excited to play a role in it. And I think the biggest trends in that business that affect us is that the supply chain is getting faster. People want immediacy. They want to order stuff and get it right away. And they want lots of choice. So the larger number of SKUs and the less patient customer with respect to getting their goods means that logistic facilities need to come closer to these major urban areas, which of course plays right into our strategy. So we're really excited. We had a good business before e-commerce, but e-commerce has been a tremendous tailwind which has take, taken our good business and turned it into a great business. If you were to look at the list of our top 25 customers, you'd walk away with a couple of conclusions. Number one, it's an extremely diversified set of customers. The top 25 represent about 20% of our revenues. And our largest customer, Amazon, represents about 3.5% of our revenues. So it's a very diversified customer base. But as a result of its diversification, it gives us a window into many, many businesses around the world. And uh, all the players that are active in the supply chain business, including DHL, most of the large 3PLs, and pretty much anybody who's in the business of moving boxes from point A to point B. And we are most useful uh, to those customers that need to expand their business quickly on a global scale. Uh, that their needs are more than one building here or one building there. And we find as being part of the plug and play ecosystem in real estate and in logistics supply chain, we have better access to those customers and our dialogue with those customers happens at a much more strategic level with people who are in charge of innovation in our company and their companies. And it's no longer about a real estate negotiation, but it's more about how do we grow our businesses better together. The reason we were very interested to work with Plug and Play is first a personal one. I've known Saeed Amidi for about 50 years and had a lot of confidence in his vision and his abilities to execute on that vision. But there was a really good business reason for it too. We're headquartered in Silicon Valley, so it wasn't because we didn't have access to these technology companies and these startups. So we're very close 
to this ecosystem. We have a lot of friends that are involved in the business, et cetera, et cetera. But we thought even with those advantages, even with the advantage of being located here, it was really important to work with plug and play to even expand our universe of companies that we were exposed to. And more importantly, help these companies get to scale and become successful much faster than they would otherwise. So we'll see if it works, but I'm pretty confident that it will. Okay, great. So uh, we do c collect statistics uh, on this program. Um, as you can see, the partners have grown each, each uh, program, which is great. 100% of the partners uh, have renewed in the last 18 months, which we're very proud of. Uh, the startups, we, we accepted this batch of 22, which you'll see very shortly. Uh, the pilots kind of increase all the time, uh, as well as office hours, uh, introductions to VCs. Some of the startups, for example, Shoof, in our first program, we introduced to Kleiner Perkins, who invested $4 million, um, which was very uh, kind of meaningful. So these are kind of the statistics, and uh, we don't have the, the, all the statistics yet uh, for today in the batch three, because this is actually one of the most important days, where a lot of you corporate partners are able to meet with the startups, and I'm sure there will be many meaningful engagements, pilots, it will still result. It, these pilots and, and engagements don't happen overnight. So uh, we're still tracking these. Uh, these are some of the trends that we see in the industry from surveying kind of the supply chain partners, uh, things like AI and machine learning or predictive analytics. How can they be implied to the supply chain? How can you use smart warehousing uh, to better optimize kind of in the, the warehouse and your distribution? Uh, and there's a major shortage in trucking in warehouse workers. So how can we recruit some of these uh, blue collar workers uh, to actually enjoy their jobs or want to work in inside of a, uh, driving a truck or inside of a warehouse. So these are just some of the, the technologies we look at uh, from blockchain where we want to have very specific use cases, not just a, a, we have a blockchain, but what are they solving in the supply chain? So uh, we're continuously evolving. And then last, I just wanted to mention, uh, these are some of the things uh, that will, it takes to some of, some of our most successful partners. So. Uh, DHL and Prologis had a great event yesterday, uh, and they're both very engaged partners. And I think they have all the right things uh, in line. So having a senior executive in the case of DHL, <clears throat> they brought uh, the top 70 executives to plug and play uh, and saw some of the startups locally in the area, all the way from Germany, to kind of experience this culture. You can see the CEO, Frank Apple. Um, so we want to have uh, the time commitment of, uh, and at least support of the senior executives. We want to have a champion fully dedicated uh, to this program uh, who can at least give 10% of their kind of job and, and focus on working with plug and play in the startups. And then obviously having business units pulling, giving uh, specific challenges for technology that they can solve. So I just wanted to thank all the partners for their time, most importantly, uh, for participating in this program. I know uh, you're all representing very large corporations and uh, we want to make sure this is valuable. So, uh, and, and then of course the startups, congratulations uh, for being accepted and, and uh, we're looking forward to many pilots and uh, successful uh, engagements with all of you. So thank you very much. I'll pass it back to Harvey uh, who will get to the rest of the show. Thanks Mike. <clears throat> So next up, I would like to introduce Xing Wang from our partner JD.com. He is the VP of JD Log Logistics. Yes, sir. Come on up. Round of applause, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Sta Huang, come from JD Logistics. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to attend this exciting event. And uh, it's my honor to have a chance to share JD and JD Logistics about the retail and the uh, supply chain industry. Uh, let's get started with the overview of how the retails transformed in the past over years. Changes of the consumer demand and the technology development, which triggered the revolution of the retail. 
we all know several years ago, mostly of the consumer buy some things in the supermarket, maybe in the department store, but now more and more consumer likely to buy some things on the network, on the, on the, on the network. The e-commerce business provided uh, more convenience and provided uh, more choices to the consumers. And now, the e-commerce also is changing from the stage one to the stage two. For scenarios, we all know at the beginning of the e-commerce, normally you just select and place order on the line, and the package will be delivered to your home or office directly. But now, you can also still select and place order on the line, but maybe the pack you can get in the offline store, just like Walmart in, China, uh, in USA. And also, you can go to an offline store and uh, select, touch the product, and place order. Then the product may be shipped out from a central warehouse and uh, delivered to your home and uh, or office directly. So the bond of the online business and the offline business is become more unclearly. And for product, in the future, before the, the producer normally just pay attention on the physical function of a product, but now more and more producers maybe pay uh, more attention on the experience of the product and pay more attention on the shopping experience. So the, with the change of the retail, the new generation of the supply chain is shows the three key features, optimization, smartness, and uh, collaboration. For optimization, uh, optimization, with the help of the uh, big data and the technology development, we have ability to optimize the, optimize the network and have ability to place the product near the consumer as closely as possible, which can reduce the frequency of the goods movement. So we believe that in the future, the supply chain will become shorter and shorter. And for smartness, also with the technology, technology development, the IT system becomes strong and more strong and stronger, which can help the decision maker to increase the uh, accuracy of the decision making. And also for the hardware, we all know the labor cost is increasing, not only in China, but also maybe globally. So we believe that in the future, more and more automatic facilities will be used in the logistics. And for collaboration, we, we believe that for every tile logistic company, we'll have more and more cooperation in the future. So before I go to the detail about the JD Logistics, I do like quickly go through uh, basic introducing about uh, JD.com. JD.com established in 2004. Now it's the biggest retailer in China by revenue. The total GMV increased more than 90,000 times in the past 14 years. And last April, JD Logistics be separated from the JD Group as an individual logistic company which can provide a, a logistic service not only just for uh, uh, JD.com but also for the arrows, retails, uh, brands or merchants. We, uh, our mission is to reduce the total logistic cost. We want to be a trusted partner of the global, logist, uh, global supply chain. And uh, with the years of rapid growth. We already have the global smart supply chain network now. We call it a GSSC in short. We already have a sixth channel network, including the normal size items network, box items network, B2B network, and, and so on. And also for smart platform, JD.com is one of the biggest e-commerce business because of the stronger and the first 
classes, IT system, especially in the B2C industry. And also, five years ago, JD spent a lot of money and spent a lot of effort on the automatic machine researching and developing. And based on the six network and based on the smart platform, we can provide a high quality service, not only just to the consumer, but also we can provide a high quality service to the uh, business, to the merchants and the brands. This is the several kinds of uh, delivery service we provide to the uh, consumers. In 2017, JD.com is the first e-commerce company in the world which can provide the same-day delivery service to the consumers. Now more than 90% of orders we can fulfill within, one day, within the same day or next day. Actually, more than 54% of orders we can fulfill within the same day. And also, we not just focus on the deliver speed, deliver speed we also focus on the deliver quality. Last year, we launched the white glove delivery service for luxury brands. And for brands or for merchants, we, after, last, after last year, we separated from JD.com. We already provided lots of super logistics service to the famous brand in the world, like the PNG or uh, like the Samsung. With the help of JD Logistics, the brand can reduce the inventory, total inventory cost and increase the deliver quality significantly. And uh, with the years of high investment in China, we already have a more than, we already have a more than uh, 500 fulfillment center in China. The total area is near uh, more than 11 million square meters. And the JD Logistics Network can cover more than 90, 90% population in China. So this is the, the, our network shows in China. And uh, at the same time, we are building a globally double 48 global network. What means the double 48 uh, global network? That means the goods enter or leave the China within 48 hours and will be fulfilled in another 48 hours in the selected countries. We already built eight harbors in China, and uh, we are continually to build a narrow Saudi supply chain nodes in the global. And uh, the, we are, now we are focused on the Southeast Asia, Europe, and the uh, uh, United States. And uh, for uh, the developer, uh, the, the, the automatic machine, actually we all know the labor cost in China in the past several years increased very much. And we, we believe that the labor cost will increase in the future. So we spend a lot of effort on the research and develop about the automatic machine. Actually, we already have a lot of uh, automatic machine and the robot used in the warehouse and the last mile delivery. In Shanghai, Jading, in Shanghai, Jading, we have a fully automatic warehouse. It's under the using, uh, under the operation. This warehouse, from the product receiving to storing to picking, packing, and last uh, sorting, all all produced, are uh, all operated by the robot without any labor there. And also, we have a drone in China, used uh, for some transportation in some mountain area. And also you, we use some autonomous delivery robot in some university. I believe that uh, if, the, if the limitation of the regulation can be relaxed, more and more 
more and more automatic facility will be used in the logistics in the future. So before I end my introducing about JD and JD logistics, I do like to show a short video about the JD logistics automatic facility for us. Okay, that's my presentation. We are looking forward to have uh, cooperate with all of you guys in the future. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Thank you very much. And JD.com will also be having a session upstairs in room 209 at 2 o'clock. Um, so I encourage everyone to, to head on up there and learn a little bit more about what they're working on because they're working on a lot of exciting stuff. Um, next up for our second keynote, I'd like to introduce up to the stage uh, Shinji San from Yamato, and he will be uh, providing a little bit of detail about what they're working on. Oh, also, quick housekeeping item. Um, if you do have an empty seat next to you, please do raise your hand. We have quite a few people in the back, um, so would love uh, an opportunity for everyone to get a little cozy and, uh, and meet someone new. So anyone in the back, please do look at all these uh, hands that are raised here up at the front. There's a few seats. Um, interspersed here and there. Um, so please do come on up and I will turn it over to you, sir. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Shinji Makira from uh, Yamato Holdings. Last year, Yamato established a new organization. Actually, I set it up. The new organization to accelerate our digital activity and uh, for that organization, I put uh, $300 million for, uh, for budget. And I prepared the very fancy room, uh, which is away from headquarters. 
And also we prepared a good team mixture of alien and mutant. <laughs> alien means uh, people from the outside, and mutant is from the inside, but very unique selected people, in inside people. So we had a team, we had a budget, and we had a room. Then I have to come up with a name. So I put that organization, the name called Yamato Digital Innovation Center, YDIC. And one of our early guests was from Cupertino, Apple. And team from Apple, we had a very good, interesting conversation. But uh, the time I introduced my new organization, YDIC, and I called it the YDIC, the face of the Yamato people changed. I didn't know why. Why Dick? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, this, this is not, I know this is not appropriate word, but this is what happened. Why? I didn't know why they put the pose between Y and Dick. <laughs> anyway. So why Dick actually sounds very cool in Japanese, <laughs> believe it or not. But it's different in English, so unfortunately. So why I start this as ice breaking, as you notice, it's very, very difficult to become digital or digitalization or digital transformation. I learned it from the day one from this experience. So having said that, who we, who we are, who is Yamato? We are the number one logistics company in Japan. Sorry, Japan Post people here, so. Uh, this is just a fact. We have 12.5 uh, billion dollar revenue, and we have 200,000 workers, very labor intensive company. And we had the biggest by market cap in Japan, and we have the dominant market share in last mile delivery. And more than that, we have the strongest brand power over in Japan over Google, Toyota, Sony, high, stronger brand power than those companies have. Also, we have a very unique history of innovation. We are almost 100 years of uh, history. And uh, first, uh, we have two innovations so far. The first one was 1929, when the founder started the uh, world's first point-to-point -point trucking service. And then, 40 years ago, last mile delivery service called Takubin was invented. And 40 years have passed. And actually, Takubin, the last mile delivery, home delivery service, has been very, very successful. That is one of the reasons of our success of the Takubin is that we consistently move, uh, consistently uh, improved the quality, and also we have been digitalizing the, uh, the entire process of Takubin. Actually, uh, our customer inquiry for Takubin is now answered by our AI engine. So what's the problem? We are actually facing the so-called innovator's dilemma. We became so dominant so dominant in the last mile delivery service in Japan. But while we struggling to become number one or dominant player, the market has changed, the Japanese society has changed, and also the competitors have changed. Now the labor shortage is a very, very uh, immediate issue in Japan. Japan is, population of Japan is shrinking and also aging. And as JD people said, that EC is explosive, showing expo explosive growth in Japan. And the competitors, well, I should say Japan Post has competitors, but more than that, the IT giants, Amazon, and also the startups are also uh, eating up our share. So once we became dominant and successful, that was the beginning of losing ourselves. So that's, that's what we call Takubin. And also, what is difficult for us is that this management triangle, strategy, business system, culture, this is all constructed to optimize Takubin service. This is a very robust system. 
But the robust system, as, as soon as this robust system has been created, we face the new challenges. That's what we call innovator's dilemma. So, we need to transform ourselves in the, in the age of digital. In, uh, in, the, in the other words, inevitable digital transformation is an immediate issue for us. But how? Several examples. We have, uh, well, I don't have the moving pictures, but uh, this is a project called Roboneko Yamato. Roboneko is a robot plus neko. Neko means cat, our brand. Roboneko Yamato, autonomous driving uh, delivery service experiment. We did it uh, for the open innovation. We did it with a partner called DNA, the start, uh, startup in Japan. And we did this uh, experiment outside of Tokyo last year, which quite showed a quite good uh, response. And we provided the uh, uh, on-demand delivery service as well as the shopping services. Next, just recently announced, this is also the collaboration with the outside partner, eVTOL project with Bell Helicopter. We don't call it drone. This is not drone, this is flying truck. I don't know what it means, the why people are laughing. Um, this, is, this carries up to 1,000 pounds and uh, at maximum speed, speed 100 miles per hour. So quite, quite a good one. And this goes up straight like Osplay and goes uh, horizontally. So we, uh, the Bell helicopter obviously develop the helicopter part and we developed the container part. But container is not just a container. It's a part of that new transportation system. Together with the autonomous driving truck and this flying truck, we are thinking to create the new transportation system. Of course, details cannot be disclosed now. But uh, this one, the prototype will be launched next, by next summer, 2019. Next one. Uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, SI, I, SIP project, Strategic Innov Innovation P Promotion Program. This is led by Japanese government, Industry 4.0. The basic idea uh, is to create, the, to create, to develop the technology, basic technology for data platform or smart logistics. The old, almost all the major Japanese supply chain companies not just logistics company, but as, like this uh, supply chain ver vertical, the major supply chain companies are the part of this program. And we are the program leader, uh, director of this project. Including blockchain, we are uh, trying to come up with the basic technologies which is necessary to visualize production, uh, pro uh, move of uh, product, and also move of the information itself. So, I just came up with three examples. Of course, there are many more, many more uh, trials with startups or the collaboration with outside partners to cope with the digitalization or digital something. But true challenge is Yamato being digitally transformed and or are we, are we uh, overcoming the innovator's dilemma through various innovative projects? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Why? It's a simple reason. You know, we cannot put the new wine in the old bottle. I don't want to use obsolete, but actually, obsolete organization, obsolete business system, obsolete culture are the real cause of problems. And without, without removing these root causes, digitalization, or digital transformation cannot occur. We, the digital, digitalization cannot reach its maximum potential. So, what should we do? Yes, we need to, not just uh, to before digital transformation, or at the same time, simultaneously, we need a corporate, entire corporate transformation. Unless we transform the company and uh, re update our business system you, we cannot digitalize or digital, do the digital transformation. So what we started 
This time, the new project, Project D. Not YDIC, four characters, but just one character, D. I learned it. So D, D stands for Darwin. As you all, many of you know, Charles Darwin, evolution of species. Only those who adapt to change will survive. So this is a total transform corporate entire transformation project. Also, I I took, uh, I'm taking that leadership. So I'm taking the leadership of both the uh, entire transformation project as well as digitalization. So what we started now is to come up with the 200 pages of report, uh, inside report, which describe every aspect of something bad or something old or obsolete point, uh, aspect of uh, our company system. So that's the kind of, uh, that's kind of a story which many people, many workers don't, don't want to hear. So many people hated me actually. But that, that was a kind of zero-based review. That was a starting point. So based on that report, it's, uh, I, I lined up uh, almost like 200,000 items are lined up to be removed or improved or changed. So our team is now working on to change it one by one. That, this is a part of that. Uh, this is part of that. The part of is, uh, this example, this is the example of Project D, action item, is corporate organizational transformation. Currently, we are the function by function organization, like many, uh, many uh, global logistics company do, is. Like uh, last mile delivery, courier, express, 3PL, contract logistics, that's function by function organization. But we, I want to change that organization entirely to the customer-based organization, retail, corporate, and global. I cannot, of course, say the details yet, but this is a great uh, big change for 200,000 workers, but totally entire change. But we need to this kind of scale, this kind of scale update of the organization itself. This is a part of Project D. So, can Yamato succeed? Is Yamato being digitally transformed or are we overcoming innovators' dilemma through various innovative projects and Project D? Of course, yes. If I can't say yes, I, have, I lose my job, so. <laughs> but, actually, seriously, I'm quite confident because now I know and we know what we should start how we should start and what to do. The issue is implementation or execution. So finally, my last comment is that uh, from management perspective, digitalization is not just a digital transformation. You have to change entire company to do that digital transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shinji-san. That was incredibly insightful. Um, I think now we're gonna move on to the startup presentation portion of the morning. And first up, we have Jason from Project 44. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, so I'm Jason DeBeau with Project 44. Uh, what we've built is the advanced visibility platform for the global logistics and transportation industry. And really, um, you, you continue to hear it over and over again in the previous presentation and in JD's presentation. Uh, we're all familiar with, with the Amazon effect uh, and what's happening, but uh, really what's happening is customers' expectations for visibility for better data quality have fundamentally changed. And we all as an industry need to meet those expectations. Uh, I was at the Prologis event last night, and we talk about what's in the, what gets in the way of actually delivering on the promise 
uh, of a more customer-centric organization, of a more opera operationally efficient supply chain. Uh, Thomas with Ericsson, uh, one thing we mentioned was uh, the eventual phasing out of some of these legacy technologies like EDI, like email, like FTP, like spreadsheets uh, that are used by many of these parties, particularly between carrier uh, upstream into, into the various constituents that, uh, that rely upon this information to really understand what's going on uh, across their network. Additionally, we heard yesterday at, at the Prologis event, what if there was a better way, what if there was a, a, a better data standard that provided more accurate, real-time, quality, structured information for all of these parties to rely upon so that we were all on the same page, we were communicating effectively, and we were responding proactively to issues that took place across uh, the supply chain. So really about five years ago, our team, uh, we've grown up in the industry, uh, we've built uh, many of the largest uh, 3PLs uh, and have managed uh, global supply chains. It was, a, it was a foundational problem that we continue to see across all aspects of the industry. Uh, our founding team worked at all the largest carriers or 3PLs or, or with uh, the largest shippers. And it was very difficult to solve this communication problem with an application or a marketplace. Foundationally, we had to change the way in which data was communicated between all these parties, particularly the exchange of information with carriers. So what we did is we built an API network that connects to thousands of carriers uh, globally, and we provide a much better way to connect to those folks to get real-time and higher quality information. We've been very, very fortunate. Uh, the company has raised $90 million of capital to date. Uh, and really that capital is being used to propel our mission to connect to every carrier across all corners of the globe and provide the very best data quality possible to all industry constituents to rely, uh, rely upon. Uh, again, we're working with some of the most progressive 3PLs and, and shippers, and what they have done is they've said, listen, we understand that customer experience is absolutely paramount we are going to go ahead and disrupt ourselves before we become disrupted. Uh, the, the, the notion of visibility is table stakes. The next question is going to be, what do we do with this information to drive actionable intelligence across our supply chain to more res uh, proactively respond to issues that take place? Yamato, great example. We just started working with, with Paul and team. Thank you very much. And uh, this introduction was made through the plug and play team. And really, as you just heard, this sort of digitization is foundational to their overall transformation efforts as they continue to try to stay ahead of, a, ahead of the curve going forward. Uh, so this is, this is how we've done it. So we've connected via API uh, to effectively every mode of transportation. And in many cases, this starts with, with track and trace, uh, which is that a top hierarchy problem of where is my where is my product where is my truck where is my plane where is my boat, um, but there's much more to this conversation, which is how do you actually expose real time information almost in an Uber like experience? How do I get a rate in real time? How do I dispatch and confirm a shipment in real time? How do I get documentation to my systems in real time? How do I drive exception management across my organization? We normalize this data and we can deliver it into any existing or future customer-facing system that you may have or internal system that you may have. What makes us quite unique is we partner with the carriers themselves to improve the way that they exchange information upstream uh, to folks that they deal with. FedEx is a, a very good example. They suffer from operational inefficiency and poor customer experience by dealing with EDI and email and spreadsheet and all these files as well. By delivering information through an API, they provide a better customer experience, they lower their operating cost, and as a result, by working with all these players, these industry leaders, Project 44 is becoming the hub of the highest quality information in the industry. So over the last 18 months, we understood that this information wasn't just uh, valuable in the existing systems like a TMS or an OMS or an ERP, but every customer or every employee that deals with transportation information, with shipping information, could benefit from this information being at the tips of their fingers. So how do you surface exceptions in real time? How do you look at predictive ETAs? How do you look at a map-based view of what's happening across your network? More importantly, by offering this information, we're dealing with 
uh, very advanced analytics from a carrier by carrier performance perspective, lane by lane, customer by customer, DC by DC, and really delivering on the promise of what does clean quality information do as far as driving more efficiency across your network. So because this new standard is being created, because we're going multimodal, because we're moving globally, we're delivering on that end-to-end -end visibility uh, mission. And as we continue to partner with amazing 3PLs and shippers that will drive us more globally, we'll continue to drive the best quality data network available. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason, very much. Next up, we have Chad from Advanced Voice Research Labs, or AVRL for short. Hi, everybody. My name is Chad Olison. I'm the CEO of Advanced Voice Research Labs. Uh, we're working with many companies in this room, actually. I'm going to play a little video, and then I'll get started. I have a package going from Houston, Texas, 77004 USA from a business site on May 29th to a non-commercial site in Phoenix, Arizona, 85012 USA and a dry IM53 container and the shipment is in Canadian dollars. So Advanced Voice Research Labs has the number one AI voice system for business applications. We're currently backed by SAP and plugging directly into ERP to eliminate manual data entry. Uh, today we've been focused on advanced inventory management advanced logistics, advanced maintenance, and what everyone will know is an expert system, which is the ability to query information out of ERP. When you look at the problems with traditional voice technology, like this device here, um, traditional NLP struggles with major things. The first would be that speech recognition accuracy is completely garbage. It's great at commonly used phrases like, what's the weather, what's the temperature, but as soon as you start to interject proper nouns, complex numbers, unique products, speech recognition tends to fail. And this is because they use probability to try and predict what you're saying. Uh, we see a classic example in energy all the time. When someone says grade A steel, a lot of times the system will hear grade day steel. Uh, this kind of brings up problem number two, which is that traditional NLP uses keywords to process information. This is exactly why your Siri gives you a response of, I didn't hear what you were saying, or your Alexa returns the wrong result. It's processing information based off of a mistranscription and speech recognition. The last item that we've been focused on is that traditional NLP does not retain state, meaning that if you want to make a change to a previously stated data set, it's impossible to do so. At Advanced Waste Research Labs, we're the first NLP engine that has a machine learner in front of it. Essentially what we do is we process unstructured text, send that unstructured text to us. What we do is we actually process phonetic-based sequences most people in this room probably won't know what these are. We process what text sounds like. In this example that you see on screen, uh, when I say this bottom line, one case, Exxon, Hijet, five, Google speech to text gives us an output of this, one K, Exxon, Hijack, five. We process how text sounds, rank it back against the domain, so that I can actually send a CRUD line to database of this bottom line, even by receiving that top line. From there, our NLU processes based off of predicting where conjunctions and inflections live in unstructured text. This is really important because I can actually parse text in real time. And a lot of companies today talk about tracking data, but we have to have a better input method of entering data into ERP, into the WMS. With AVRL, parsing text and cleaning it up before we're entering it in, we're using our system as a wide mouth funnel to capture big data. We have a modular-based AI. Because of this, it allows us to do very unique things. I'm going to show two examples of this tech. Uh, one is live with a customer. Crunchy Cheetos 5 cases, Fritos 9 cases, Lay's Barbecue 2 cases, Ruffles 4 cases, Funyuns 3 cases, Chili Cheese Fritos 2 cases, Cheeto Puffs 4 cases, Doritos Blaze, six cases, Fritos Scoops, two cases, and Hot Lime Cheetos, one case. And as you'll see at the bottom, uh, there's about a 60% mistranscription rate. And on the top, we're actually sending CRUD lines directly to Salesforce in about 150 milliseconds. Right now with this application, we're processing information at 100% accuracy. The brakes look fine, but the windows are very dirty. The oil pressure is low, the suspension looks good, and the rear left reflector is cracked. 
So this is a quick example of how someone's using this inside maintenance. Um, why people are using this as a wide mouth funnel to capture big data is because you'll see down the center brakes, fluid levels, oil pressures, reflectors, etc. That's structured information. Um, what you see in the blue outlying area is actually unstructured metadata. What we're doing is we're parsing text in real time, picking out what's structured, what's unstructured, and sending it to database for machine learning. You see a lot of companies like SAP talk about Leonardo or Salesforce, Salesforce talking about Einstein. It's really impossible to have big data unless you have better ways to capture that big data. What we're doing is we're capturing it, cleaning up, sending it to database for machine learning so they can start running predictive maintenance, et cetera. So for us, what we've been focused on is increasing efficiency inside of enterprise. Uh, today our systems are performing 350% faster at entering data directly into ERP. Um, because of that, we've been focused on cost reduction initiatives or recovery on revenue. Uh, currently right now, with some of our Fortune 10, Fortune 50, and Fortune 100 customers, at scale they're seeing 35 to $75 million in cost savings. Lastly, we are the first voice tech company to be able to process native language with non-native product. Um, in this example on screen, you'll see it says 312 packs of Diet Coke Zero. In this top line, this is in Russian, and if we process this with a Russian speaker, what it transcribes out is 312 packs of Diet Cocaine Zero. That's obviously not what we're looking for. So what we're allowing companies to do is allow their native speakers to speak their native language, such as Spanish with German product and transcribing it back into ERP correctly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chad. Uh, next up, we have Nate from Alchemy IoT. Good day all, Nate Jackson. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Interim CEO at Alchemy IoT. Our product and our company delivers predictive maintenance solutions for industrial machinery. And our market opportunity resides that many of the existing solutions today are overly complex, they take a long time to deploy, and they're expensive. So what we provide is a simple solution that eliminates the need for data scientists, to deliver predictive maintenance capabilities. The name of our product is called Clarity. It's a SaaS-based application. We tap into existing data infrastructures. So we uh, require existing data network, uh, ex existing sensors, and so forth. But we can connect into different data infrastructure types, be that existing historians, um, IoT clouds, or we can connect directly to the asset itself. Um, we then uh, pass that through a robust anomaly detection engine, but where our real differentiation came, comes on board is that we leverage artificial intelligence to increase the accuracy of our anomaly detection. Once we have determined then the asset health is degraded or changed, is that we can automate the downstream workflow associated with that. So if we determine an asset is unhealthy, is that we can notify reliability engineers and then set up inspection orders and pass that off to CMMS or EAM systems automatically. So this is taking a look at one of our proof of concepts, proof of validations. This is a large three-phase transformer. So for those of you that are not familiar with the asset, it's a roughly a million dollar asset. And this shows the top lines is taking a look at the anomaly detections or the data before artificial intelligence and the bottom line is taking a look after artificial intelligence. So in this particular case, this customer was taking on average eight to 10 weeks to develop their predictive models. Our artificial intelligence replicated those capabilities in six days. And so, so what we're looking to do is, once we have determined that the um, artificial learning has plateaued, we consider the analytic is then trained. So we understand that taking an AI approach, an anomaly approach, um, has some trade-offs. So our kind of cliche statement is that we deliver 80% of the results or the outcomes at 20% of the costs. And so really how this breaks down is the concept of uh, replacing data scientists with artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, and that we have a universal approach to our analytics and algorithms. So we have applied this 
as we just showed with large industrial transformers. We've done it as well with um, uh, data storage, um, disk drives, and also telecom equipment with the same um, algorithm and approach to um, analytics. So how we get started and how we engage um, organizations like you all is listed here up on the slide. Typically, people get started with the, the middle case there, which is called an early warning case study. It's a forensics exercise that we work with your organizations to identify events that are either painful financially or reputationally. We get the data that precedes those events, run it through our solution, Clarity, and then, prevent, uh, and then provide you all with a report of what our solution would done. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nate. Next up, we have Moses from Allegro AI. Hi, I'm Moses, uh, CEO and founder of Allegro AI, where we do deep learning, computer vision platform, and solutions. So what is this all about? Traditionally, we are regularly thinking about software and solution solving in a very straightforward model. We have a sensor, if it's block, let's leave the door open. But as people, when we see those images, we instantly get the full context of the entire scene. And we immediately can construct a more refined logic on what to do in the right case, for example. So how do we construct this uh, structure of information from the visual data that we get. So we, we first need to have the sensor, the image sensor, and then we need to structure it. The immediate approach is to start with the infrastructure. Usually we have something in house, we have the data. Let me make a long and unpleasant story short. The bottom line is money is being spent Time goes by, and at the end, this company who manufactures uh, elevators will not get a better product, but they will invest a lot of resources in building infrastructure. This is where we come in. In Allegro, we spent the last couple of years building end-to-end -end solution for deep learning and computer vision, really starting from the data acquisition, ingestion, uh, the training process, and ending with deployment and feedback loop all bit built into a single platform. A few examples of our customers and use cases. Physical asset management, where we want to construct um, an abstraction of what's going on in the physical um, world, locating objects, free space, etc. We can think of uh, visual quality control, where in a production line, we want to detect malfunctions or failure cases um, in parts. And in security, when, we're, when we want to construct the abstraction of um, what's going on in a scene with the input of only a video stream. And obviously, we have the autonomous trucks, drones, etc., cetera, um, and robotics, where we need to navigate in the physical world and construct very complex logic on top of the sensors that we have. A few specific examples. This, customer's, this customer of ours um, is building an off-road autonomous vehicle. They were able to very quickly um, create a segmentation of the very unique data that they collect in order to better navigate their uh, vehicle. Another interesting example, this customer is building um, a fleet um, truck management system with an active maintenance solution where they scan automatically the undercarriage of trucks and can automatically detect failure cases before they actually fail um, in, while, while driving. So how do you work with Allegra? You either implement it in-house, you either uh, work with a third-party vendor uh, to offer an end-to-end -end solution, or you come directly to us for consul consulting and professional services. 
Um, the takeaway from this entire presentation is with our platform, our customers uh, retain the full ownership um, of their data because with deep learning and AI, this is important. Data is actually IP. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Moses. Next up, we have Sheena from Element Analytics. Hi, everybody. I'm Sheena Vidani with Element, and I'm head of marketing um, at the company. I'm pleased to give you a quick overview on, on uh, our company and our offering. So Element, um, we were really uh, created to help democratize industrial data in order to transform operational performance. And the way that we do this is through the Element platform in which we're taking both operations data, enterprise data, and everything in between in order to make it very easy to use and trustworthy um, anywhere in the organization. So a, a quick overview on our company. Uh, we're based in San Francisco. Um, what's really unique about us is the team that we bring together. So we have folks who have deep experience working at industrial companies, um, as well as industrial software companies, and bringing that together with folks who have uh, deep uh, roots in Silicon Valley working at big data uh, companies such as uh, Google, LinkedIn, myself, I was at MongoDB um, as well. Um, uh, uh, some other interesting aspects are really around our industrial uh, expertise. So from an investor standpoint, we're backed by uh, a lot of uh, companies who have experienced the exact problem that we're going after, and we're very closely partnered with both uh, Microsoft on the IT side of the house as well as OSI Soft on the operations side. And we've also been recognized by a few uh, key vendors, including Gartner as a, a cool vendor. The real challenge that we are addressing is that there, you know, most of your organizations, you already have tons and tons of data residing in the enterprise. The challenge is that it's siloed. It's residing on individual laptops. It's residing at a, at a given plant. There's even enterprise data. But the connections between all of these data sources are what is really missing in order to unlock both analytics and then the insights that are going to come out of those analytics. Our vision is that um, asset twins are really what is going to enable this 360 de degree view of any piece of equipment or any asset. So somebody in maintenance or reliability or in management, they all have their own view of what they would want to see from that data. And we are creating those relationships between those silo data sources in order to enable uh, such views for diverse data constituents. So our solution, again, is the Element platform, and we're taking the data from the assets or the machines all the way to the business um, decision makers. And in our platform, what we're doing is we're combining that data, we're creating that context around the data by combining both operations data and other data sources that have the context, creating the asset twins, and once those asset twins are created, we're really able to help ensure that they're trustworthy worthy, and that they're always up to date whenever there are changes in the underlying data or assets. And then again, we connect this back to key analytic applications, um, visualization sources, or uh, to your own data scientists or other folks who want to drive insights from that. A quick key study, uh, case study, so we're working with uh, leading Fortune 500 type of companies um, uh, across the globe. Uh, one client is an oil and gas uh, uh, super major, and with them we worked on a project to take, um, you know, as you can see, this vast uh, scale of data, which was coming from 6,000 different data sources, over 1.5 million sensor streams, and uh, this was across 33 um, of their offshore assets. And what we were able to do was to reduce the time that they would otherwise have spent building these data models or asset twins and spreadsheets, and uh, you know, which was actually impossible to do in a manual fashion and do reduce the time by over 90%. And we're enabling various use cases from that data from creating um, an overarching federal structure of the data to enabling um, anomaly applications on top of those 33 assets um, as well. So if you'd, uh, if you'd like to uh, learn more, feel free to come by our table out in the expo hall or contact me anytime, Sheena at elementanalytics.com. We'd be happy to give you some uh, more uh, explanations of our product and use cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheena. 
Uh, next up, we have Pat from Losix. Hi, uh, Losix. I'm going to give you an idea of what we're doing. Um, we are really using some new technology we developed in the area of low-power wireless networks and cameras to increase the vi visibility and ultimately improve the efficiency of the warehouse and logistics operations. Uh, so the problem with doing this is you really often need good data. Everyone knows you've got to get more efficient operations you know, with e-commerce, delivery times that are expected. But it's got to be really useful data. And you've got to be able to adapt and see things in real time. So this can be a little difficult can be expensive. You've got an outfit of a warehouse with a pile of sensors. Often what drives the cost there is not just the devices, but the installation, running cables to all these things. And if you want to run it yourself, then you've got the management costs associated with that. Another thing we want to address is you can get readings from individual sensors, but often you need to know what's going on around you at the same time. You know, where did that happen exactly? And when I want to see what's going around me, often there's really nothing better than a picture. And last of all, we don't want to build some closed system you know, where you're locked into one solution. We're building an open system, so we're focusing on getting the data. A lot of people working on analytics, you can feed that data into these different types of analytics. So we're introducing two products. First one is a visual sensor. It's a truly wireless camera. Uh, runs on a couple AA batteries for up to a few years, you know, depending on how often you want to take pictures. So there's a wireless base station that you know, will control 10, 20 of these cameras, collect all the data. You can take pictures on demand, on a timer, in response to things moving around in front of you. And we built out a cloud system, collects all this data, and we have an open API so people can build their own analytics on top of it and feed the data into those very easily. Second product we're introducing is what we call a local positioning system. Think GPS and doors, right? And so we build on the same low power architecture that we did with our wireless camera so we can get good battery life. And here, now we're using Wi-Fi signals rather than some odd RF frequencies to get sub-meter location accuracy right, within an arm's reach. And we use the same cloud API so the data is equally accessible. So things we've started looking at, we started with looking at what's going on at the docks. You know, trucks coming and going, what's the dwell time look like? Then you can put a camera inside also, and you can say, well, why, why did I have a problem there? You know, how are things moving around? Did I have the right assets ready for it? Once things come off the trucks, you can follow the inventory as it moves through the warehouse. Is it ending up where it really ought to be? Where do I go get it? And then you can look at assets and asset utilization. Do I have the forklifts, people going to do the right things at the right times? And with that information, then you can adapt quickly, and you can start doing smarter picking routes and scheduling. Uh, so we've done a couple deployments so far. First one on the wireless camera. We put in a warehouse where we were monitoring about 50 truck bays. Uh, this started earlier in the year. So this has been running really relatively smoothly now. Um, we did not do the analytics. Rather, with the open API, we had a partner that customized the analytics and how it presented the information to the customers. Um, and the next one, uh, just a couple of months ago, we did a location sensor demonstration. We were in an operating warehouse. We started small, just in a corner of the warehouse. And we were able to show that using the Wi-Fi signals, we were able to locate things, yes, to within about a meter. So you could figure what aisle you were on, where you needed to go to get stuff, and you could follow assets around, be they forklifts, people picking and placing things. And there it is. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Seth from Logistaview. Good morning. My name is Seth Patton. I'm the founder of Logistaview. I'd like to start by asking a simple yet profound question. What if your business software could see? Specifically, what if your workforce software could see? Logistaview's focus on computer vision driven workflow is one of the reasons we were named a Gardner Cool Vendor for 2018. Many of you experience common challenges with your workforce today. 
There's a well understood skills gap that everyone's talking about how to solve. And depending on what region you live in, labor shortages are a real challenge. So how can you deal with the fact that digital transformation is unfortunately leaving the workforce behind all too often and causing training scenarios with antiquated technology that are just exacerbating costs of labor as turnover and wage competition impact your workforce? Looking down a decade into the future, it doesn't necessarily get any better. You still have a skills gap that needs to be re resolved, and you still have potential labor shortages. In fact, demographic data suggests that labor shortages could continue to get worse over the course of time. So you're also going to have a generational shift. The next generation of workforce will have grown up with AI and AR on smartphones in their pockets. What they will know as computer interface is augmented reality and artificial intelligence. And that technology will be crucial to maintaining their engagement inside your workforce. So Logistiview is workforce productivity software for enterprise uh, logistics, uh, main, or, um, manufacturing, and retail operations. Our objective is to go from this, basically text-based passive interfaces, to graphical AI-driven human interfaces. The Logistiview platform is patent-pending software that improves the productivity and job satisfaction simultaneously of the frontline workforce. We do this by combining computer vision, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality with a powerful configuration engine that allows you to use vision-driven workflows on next-generation smart glass devices and standard Android-based handheld devices. Smart glasses drive the productivity of the future. Hands-free operations are transformational. Persistent visual information helps give, him, uh, give workforce uh, and workers the opportunity to remember information more freely. And then uh, efficient data capture and effortless data capture allows you to use computer vision and wearable scanners to determine intent and filter data with AI. You can also rethink the handheld computer. Today, many of you already use devices like the Zebra TC8000 in this picture in your operations, but do you use them with computer vision? Are you taking advantage of all the capabilities that this device can already do today? With Logistiview, you can. You can simplify text interfaces and make them visual instruction based. You can also simplify data capture using computer vision or, again, the onboard scanner that these devices already possess. With the Logistiview workbench, you can go beyond uh, simple standard operating procedure, you can build your own process. By using our graphical workflow editor, you can drag and drop process steps in a simple flowchart, go in, connect your data from your information systems to the process steps that your workforce is going to go through, and then ultimately build, test, and deploy rapidly for vision-driven and AR-native work processes. Logistiview's vision is to connect people with everything. The reality is, as has been stated many times, digital transformation is a company-wide transformation, but people have to be at the middle of it. So if you can connect your people with everything around them that you've already digitized, how much more productive and efficient can your workforce be? Ultimately, it gives the opportunity to plan with real-time information dynamically and make intelligent decisions on the, or in the field at the point of work. Some of, our, uh, some of our early customers, such as DHL and uh, Radial, are experiencing significant gains in some of the pilots we've done with them. Um, okay, looks like there's been a glitch in the system. That first bullet point is supposed to say that we've been able to achieve up to 50% efficiency improvement in picking operations. Um, the second one is that we can train in as little as Okay, looks like the system is, sorry about that. We can train in as little as 15 minutes because it's graphically based and we're, in, we're able to connect with people on an intuitive level instead of having to go through complex training procedures. Um, we also have a customer who's implementing augmented reality put walls. This is a, a wall that allows you to place products and instead of having a hardware version, which often is very costly and very fixed, we can provide augmented reality virtual put walls at a cost of four to one compared to a hardware put wall. 
And lastly, our customers are already experiencing the value of being able to divine or define and configure their own workflow. And uh, we're finding that, or they're finding that they can own the process instead of having to come to us for every single time. Ultimately, um, there's a lot of benefits, and if you want to come and experience them for yourself, we have a live demo in the expo hall. We'd love to have you at the demo table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seth. Next up, we have Austin from Mo Bagel. Welcome to the stage. Hi, I'm Austin Huey, Director of Corporate Strategy and Partnership at MoBagel. Our vision is to democratize data science for everyone and to become your most trusted data science partner by providing a fast, stable, accurate, automated machine learning software so we can save your precious time and really focus on solving important supply chain and logistics problems and ultimately generate more business value to your business. Currently, we have a branch here in San Jose, and we also have presence in Taiwan, Japan, and China. As of now, we have achieved seven-fold year-over-year revenue growth. And now, uh, we are on track to achieve $3 million this year. From our enterprise customer feedback, we found that there are two main challenges. They are, first, data science projects are very time-consuming. It takes usually about two to three months to complete and to come up with a working model. And second, data science teams take a long time to build and they are very expensive. Lucky for you, we have developed a product that tackles these issues. We call it Decanter. No data science knowledge is required and no programming is required. Simple, fast, automated. Imagine the great dots are they running back and forth for 10 to 20 hours and wait? That was five seconds. Imagine it to be 10 hours. It's tedious, time consuming, and it doesn't add any value to your business. During prediction, our decanter automates everything and selects the best model for you. So you don't have to worry anything about it. Our decanter AI engine consists of uh, many machine learning algorithms, including regression, if you want to predict numerical values, classification, if you want to predict categorical uh, predictions, and time series, clustering, and also deep learning. Our past use cases include predictive maintenance, employee turnover, campaign targeting, and inventory management. Right now, we do mostly direct sales by software licensing, as well as working with channel partners, such as system integrators and consulting firms. Our team members graduated from top universities around the world. Our company is truly an international company. We have received fundings from investors globally and have established business partners worldwide. In addition, we have achieved top rankings in international data science competitions. Again, my name is Austin Huang. We're looking for Series A investors and business partners to conduct pilot studies. Let's democratize data science together. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Um, so, we're going to take a quick five minute break. Uh, so please get up, stretch your legs. We're going to start with the next presentation, 10.50. So I think that's in the next six or seven minutes or so. Thank you.
We had our third selection day for the supply chain and logistics program. It was an amazing event where we had partners flying in from all around the world. We watched about 32 startups present and we're going to accept about 22 of them to actually take part in the program and give them the full resources that comes with being part of the plug and play community. It's traditionally very difficult for corporations to innovate. They have a lot of structure to find around their existing businesses. And so as startups, we have zero structure. And so by combining the two strengths and relative weaknesses of each side, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to develop really great products and great applications. The things that we look forward to is building close relationships with some of the largest corporate partners in the world that Plug and Play makes available and helps facilitate the process. We would be looking for guidance, help, and of course the ecosystem that Plug and Play has established is really second to none. The introduction to enterprises that may have an interest in working with Boardwalk Tech would be tremendous. Plug and Play has a very good partners and these partners represent a significant market share and they are also market leaders and for WAVE to work with such world leaders is of course a huge incentive for us. Plug and Play Supply Chain Program is very unique from what I've seen in that it facilitates connections with actual customers. I'm most looking forward to about being part of the Plug and Play ecosystem is the exposure to brands who are truly open to innovation and recognizing that there are always better ways of doing things. We're bringing those who are really looking into the specific supply chain use cases because they want to work with the startups, pilot their technology and potentially implement it for a successful new offering in their businesses. Okay, everyone, we are going to get started, so please return to your seats. We're going to get started with the next presentation from Foghorn. Uh, we have Keith. I need to get you a clicker, so let me just give you the microphone. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Keith. Um, we're going to get started here, so please do find your seats and we'll get started. Terrific. Thank you, everyone, uh, very much. My name is Keith Higgins. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Foghorn. I'm going to speak very quickly because the three-minute uh, counter has already started. Uh, the transformation, the digital transformation of industrial organizations is projected to deliver $11 trillion over the next few years of value. Right now, what is slowing that down? What's the single biggest thing that's slowing that down? Is that you cannot take the cloud and stick it onto the industrial edge. It's just too big, it doesn't fit. Four years ago, Foghorn was founded as a very contrarian company focused on edge computing and how do you take a lot of intelligence, real-time streaming analytics and machine learning and design it for a very small constrained footprint. PLCs, industrial PCs, control systems, Raspberry Pi devices, those types of things that need a lot of intelligence today to deliver that kind of value. That's really what the company was founded to do. That idea and the early success of the company uh, was able to generate funding from some of the largest industrial leaders uh, in the world, including GE, Honeywell, Bosch, Yokogawa, largest oil and gas company uh, in the world, Saudi Aramco. I see many of our customers here today, by the way, and, and partners. Um, we have 100 plus completed commercial engagements globally today, which puts us from an edge computing perspective, I think, ahead of just about everybody else. Uh, and as you'll see from, from some slides, we have uh, uh, quite a bit more uh, uh, 
uh, areas of success. For those of you not as familiar, why Edge? Why do you have to go to the Edge? Why was everything cloud a few years ago and now everything seems to be Edge? In a lot of cases, there's limited or no connectivity. Some places because of security concerns are not even allowed to have access. There's simply too much data being generated to move it to the cloud and move it back. Um, there's a lot of increasing risk of security and cyber attacks. There's um, a lot of latency and real-time decision-making needs and uh, a need for much more high-fidelity analytics. Uh, this clock is going faster. I'm going to show this slide um, really quickly to show you there's a lot of technology here. I can't go through it all in three minutes, but if I don't show you a really complicated technical slide, you'll think we have the emperor has no clothes. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, these are the three things that you have to be able to do at the edge. You have to be able to do real-time analytics on streaming data. You have to be able to shrink machine learning models to put them into small footprints. And you have to have a very OT-centric toolkit. That's the three things that you absolutely need to do. This is just the obligatory award slide, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. We've been highly recognized. I think everybody has one of those. Um, these are the primary use cases. These are the ones that are delivering huge economic returns for our customers today. Condition monitoring, prescriptive maintenance, asset performance optimization, process efficiency, operational intelligence. This is our ecosystem partnership, uh, 50 plus growing, growing every day, including all the major cloud providers. My time is up. We have a booth outside. We'd love to chat with you. That was the fastest three minutes uh, 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 in a while. So I really appreciate your attention. Uh, hope to have a conversation with you again. I see many industrial organizations here today. We'd love to, love to have a chat. Round of applause. Thank you, Keith. Next up, we have Avram from Quantified. Hi, everybody. I'm Aviram from Quantified. And Quantified, we work with big data, but we like to talk about meaningful data. And what does that mean? This is not news for anyone. Uh, the data that's available for everyone is growing rapidly. 85% of it, if not more, is um, unstructured, but only less than 10% is something that you can actually use to advance your business. So how do you get to that 10%? So that's what we do at Quantified. We, first, we take in all the data. It can be the unstructured text data. It could be from social media, reviews, blog, forums, anything that's available, but also what our clients have internally, their voice of customer, call logs, email, et cetera. And, the cap and we also take the KPI that's interesting to our clients, what they want to optimize to, what they want to improve. It could be from our clients, but again, we can also get it from third parties in case of competitors. And we put it all together, and what comes out of it is the signal that's relevant for your business. So this is actually an example of buzz. This is buzz from Twitter data for a brand. And this is a sales curve for that brand. And as you can see, there's no correlation between the two. But if we take our signal, that's very correlated from the buzz to the, to the sales. But that's, not, that, that's just our starting point, because then we can take any point on that line and know who are the people that are talking, not just what they're saying, but who, who are they demographically and what their interests are and what driving them to buy or not buy your product. So the marketing use cases for that are obvious, and we've been doing that for about six years. These are some of our clients, um, and why are we here in the supply chain? As kind of by accident. Um, we actually, while delivering insights to our client, we were able to tell them a lot of insights about how they manage their inventory. Um, we started doing that uh, after the case was over, after a big marketing campaign, and they launched a new product, and we tell them, well, how you distributed it was very bad, because the people you were about to target, they're not the one that actually bought the product, so we were left out of stock at some places when you have much more stocks in other places. So doing it in hindsight, it's easier, but what we're doing now is doing it in real time. And what is even more interesting is that we're able to tell, to predict demands and trends based on launches of similar products in the past. So we're able to, t to let you know what we think is your product, how it's going to react in different markets. We'll basically be able to create a map of demands and how the trend will go when you launch the product and after a few months. So this is for quantifying. We're doing a lot of marketing and operations as well. We're doing also financial crimes. Um, and we're here in supply chain. We're happy to talk to you and um, get into more details and show you a case study that we've done in the past. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Next up, we have Wes from Sentient Science. Thanks, Harvey. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Wesley Thomas. I'm a vice president at Sentient Science. And um, you'll be interested in this presentation if you own or operate uh, rotating machinery. So that could be aerospace, energy, uh, industrial equipment in the railroads, um, or if you're looking for uh, investment series C or greater. Our company's been around for a long time, since 2001 is when we started the R&D, uh, but we've been commercialized for the last five years. And the types of problems that we work on solving are predictive maintenance, when is a rotating asset going to fail, asset life extension, how do I make that asset last longer by changing the way that I'm maintaining it today, and supply chain optimization, meaning Am I making the right investments in preventive maintenance and making the right investments in my suppliers that give the best return on investment? And while I had everyone here today, um, while we've been in the plug and play cohort, we have launched a wind challenge. Uh, we're on the board of directors of Wind Europe and working with our <laughs> wind turbine market. Uh, we took our software and made it into an online game that all of you can play, uh, but I thought it'd be a good way to show some things that make us unique. So first thing we do is we create a very detailed model of your asset. In this case, it's a wind turbine, but it could be anything with bearings and gears. And we use material science and the study of friction to make these models and predict not only what is going to fail now or what already has damage, as many big data applications do, but we're looking at years into the future, which assets are going to fail when so you can take action today and make them last longer. Then we tell you inside that asset, what are the most critical pieces of it that are going to fail first? Specific bearings, specific gears, and make a list of what we call asset life extension actions um, of things you can do like replacing parts or changing the grease to make them last longer. And in the software, you can go in, click on replacing a part. Uh, in this case, I re-greased a bearing. We'll tell you it extended the life by 15 months, it cost you $440, and over the life of that asset, you're gonna save $6,000. So we just finished this uh, with a number of uh, companies across the world. We had 700 folks play, they worked on about 4,000 assets, and we increased the financial return of those assets by 860 million. So that's pretty remarkable. But the good, the good news is this isn't just an online game. Uh, we are a global company with customers in US, Europe, and China. And if you own or operate uh, rotating equipment that needs to last longer, or you're looking for a Series C or later investment opportunities, I'd be glad to talk to you more. Thank you very much. Have a good day, guys. Thank you, Wes. Next up, we have Johnson from 300 Cubits. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, I'm Johnson Leung, so the co-founder of 300 Cubits. So, uh, in 300 Cubits, we are a group of people coming from shipping, finance, and technology background, where we build blockchain-based solutions for the shipping industry. We have already one production system in production. So uh, the system is a booking deposit module, where we use cryptocurrency and blockchain to enable the shipping industry to do booking deposit. So, so booking deposit, why? So, um, in our day-to-day -day life, when we book hotel, airline, we usually pay first. So, so most of the time, we, of course, we show up. Otherwise, we lose the value of the deposit that we put in. Uh, but in shipping, so, um, the customer do not need to pay anything so, when they make booking. So, so you can imagine, so a lot of them don't show up. In fact, 30% of the time, so the customers do not show up after they make the booking. So how the carrier deal with it? So, um, the carrier just simply overbook. So, um, so what originally is a problem for the carrier become also a problem for the customers. Because the customer would get a confirmed booking, show it at the port, and find out that they could not get on the vessel that they book. So, so um, over the years, so, um, the carrier has been trying to convince the customers to place a booking deposit when they book. But booking deposit itself, so, um, although a solution, but have another problem because it entails a more working capital requirement for the customers, and then the cost come with the additional capital. 
So um, the shipping industry is always over capacity. If a one carrier insists in booking deposit, so then the customer will go to another carrier. So we need a financial solution. So that's where we're coming in. So we use a cryptocurrency um, liquidity. So um, you know there's a Bitcoin and all those. So the market value is almost a 200 billion despite all the correction that we have seen over the last 12 months. So it's a lot of liquidity. So what we do is we tap into liquidity and create value where the shipping industry could use that value as a booking deposit. So exactly how? So, um, we, we sold 2% of our tokens, um, so it's around 2 million. So people pay us 50 cents each. So effectively, so we can say, OK, our token of market value was 50 cents each. So when we give the token for free for the shipping company and their customers to allow them to use a booking deposit, they know there's a market out there. They can sell the token for 50 cents each. And then they use the token as a booking deposit. When they're using it, they create a circulation and demand for the token. They sustain the value in the crypto market, which allow them to continue to use as a booking deposit. So, so far, we have already some launched our systems in the end of July. So we get some major carriers like MERS using an intra-Asia trade. So CMA, CGM using a solution in long-haul trade. So we get some multiple carriers, including China, Costco, MSC. So they actually run multiple pilot in our solution. And then from the shipper side, we have some large names, uh, including so one of our corporate partners here from Park and Pray. So BASF so now so scheduling a pilot. Uh, we also have some large supermarket chain in Germany, so Vivi, some, some Missouri Chemicals. So, so a bunch of large um, corporations are using our solution with the carrier as a booking deposit. So, but at the same time, so we also signed up with Dubai, so actually developing, so Dubai government developing another blockchain solution so locally in Dubai for the shipping so, um, and uh, the shipping customer communities. So um, we have a booth outside. If there's any questions, uh, I welcome so anyone come around to talk to us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Johnson. Next up, we have Kushal from Far Eye. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kushal, co-founder of Far Eye. Uh, our journey actually started with looking at the uh, e-commerce world. And I guess everyone sitting in this room can agree there is an experience which we get while we are ordering online on any of the marketplaces or the direct sites. And then there is a different experience which we kind of go through once we have uh, placed the order, right? Uh, online, we're talking about customer acquisition cost. We're using all kinds of data. We're working on uh, in terms of science, uh, understanding about the customer. And there's a lot of data points which exist. But we talk about logistics, it's still working in the same way. So that's one of the problems which we kind of started with. Uh, there are some numbers there. If you look at uh, the overall parcel shipping, which happened last year, it was about 280 billion. And there were 75 billion parcels which were shipped last year. It's about to cross 100 billion uh, in the next couple of years. This is some kind of uh, stats as in consumer, or as a 3PL, or as a retailer we kind of went through. Uh, like almost all the consumers expect a seamless online delivery experience when they are ordering uh, from uh, any marketplace. And that the same experience is uh, expected after the order is completed. Where uh, we kind of started was uh, we wanted to change the entire story. And then I'll show you if uh, we start with Far Eye what kind of an experience we bring to you as a 3PL or as a retailer. So one, the first basic thing comes is, can I personalize my delivery? Can I update my location? Can I track it real time? If I'm there at the event right now, can I still communicate to the driver? Uh, where am I? How do I want that shipments to be delivered? And the information is happening directly between the customer and the driver. If you want to drive uh, any message around that, that's also something which is driven through the platform. Uh, it could be more from a feedback perspective as well. Uh, it could be Uber-like tracking experience. Once the shipment is out, 
in the last mile or in the LTL journey as well. So we're talking more about not just data and visibility, but actually using it back in your operations. How do you improve the operations using the intelligence which already exists, and not really look at the dashboards and analyze what's happening around. We've been doing this for a couple of years now. Uh, these are some of the improvements which we have had in the industry. We have uh, increased the driver attempts by 18% uh, per driver. There has been a significant amount of reduction in the overall delivery cost. The first attempt success, uh, that trade has been increased by about 20 plus percentage, and we have saved uh, two plus man days per hour. These are some of the use cases which we kind of, the platform runs through. It could be two-man delivery, white goods, uh, LTL, parcel delivery, uh, e-commerce, uh, or even the postal deliveries which we kind of run, uh, including the returns part of it as well. We work with about 100 plus brands uh, globally. We've got our offices in uh, US, uh, Singapore, Dubai, uh, India is where we kind of headquartered and started our company. These are some of the brands where we already work uh, as in date. Uh, you talk about the largest retailers, the largest 3PL companies, uh, the FMCG companies, or uh, the food delivery companies as well. And it's not just about the experience part when I uh, kind of talk about the last mile. Uh, it goes through the route optimization it goes through the driver planning. So all parts of your uh, LTL or last mile delivery is what Farai kind of caters to. I've been able to show you some stuff around the experience part only, but this is the entire suite of uh, what we kind of offer. Uh, we've got a booth outside. Uh, feel free to kind of step by, and we can show you a quick demo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Dimitar from Transmetrics. Hello, my name is Dimitar Pavlov, and I'm representing Transmetrics. What do we do? We are predictive optimization software, uh, which is based on machine learning and AI, uh, exclusively for transport and logistics. Now, why did we focus on this area? Because the industry is huge, but it's also extremely inefficient. And a few of the root causes of inefficiencies here. First, data quality. It's, um, it's really bad throughout the whole industry. Uh, it's, it's kind of an industry standard. So uh, many companies are not really able to clearly assess utilization, and you can't improve what you can't measure. Another root cause for inefficiency is uncertainty. Shipments often come in the last minute, and having too much or too little reserve capacity can result in either low utilization levels or uh, unsatisfied customers and potentially missed revenues. Planning is also a big, to big thing because it's often done on a gut feeling and with relatively primitive tools like Excel and in some extreme cases even whiteboards. Um, having identified <clears throat> all of these reasons as well as many others, we created a set of algorithms which are first with the help of AI and machine learning significantly improving data quality, uh, which enables companies to, to spot hidden inefficiencies and execute better data-driven decision making. Then the already improved historical data is combined with a set of external factors, which helps us produce highly 90 to 95% accurate forecast, demand forecast. And then this demand forecast is fed into the optimization module, which suggests the most optimal plan. Um, here you can see some of the companies that, that benefited from our technology so far. Um, companies like DHL, like CMA, CGM, DPD, and so on. It's important to note that we, we have three products, one uh, which optimizes network-based businesses, um, another one which is for, for asset owners, basically uh, based on demand forecast, helping them cost-effectively relocate their assets where demand is, li demand is likely to occur, rather than staying idle at other locations. And the third one, which is uh, now uh, currently being developed, is uh, again based on demand forecast, and it helps um, warehouse managers plan better their warehouse shifts and stuff with all the skills there. So basically the technology is there and with relatively little effort it can be um, adjusted to meet the needs and requirements of all types of logistics providers. A few of our success stories with DPD for example, uh, which is the second, uh, groupage, uh, big, second biggest groupage uh, network in Europe, we managed to, um, to significantly increase their utilization levels. They have been using the system since 2016 
and also more importantly, we managed to increase uh, to decrease sorry their total transportation cost by eight percent. Based on this success, we rolled out in another country uh, last year, and now we are in discussions for further rollouts um, around Europe. Another success story is with the uh, company Kuhn Nagel. We had a, a major data cleanse enrichment project with them, and we managed to significantly increase the availability of shipments, uh, volume and dimensions, uh, which helped them really assess uh, utilization and, and how effective the whole network is. And based on this uh, success, we signed a major contract for um, further projects with them uh, last month. Uh, that's, these are just two examples of our work, and I would be happy to discuss more of them off stage at our booth. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Mark from Agent IQ. Good morning, everyone. Uh, There's a slight change uh, from our end. My name is Mangesh. I'm with Agent IQ. And what we are is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning based transformational customer engagement platform. So uh, in terms of customer support and customer service, much uh, bandied about terms. However, there's been an evolution. If you go back several decades, what started with uh, the, the, in, during the 70s, the focus was on products, evolved into products and services in the 90s, the last decade. Customer centricity was uh, pretty much the buzzword, and there was a focus on that. However, today, it is very important to uh, manage customer expectations who increasingly uh, demand real-time responses, asynchronous, uh, they come in asynchronously, they come in uh, at any given point, anywhere, and expect to have low latency responses. So what we focus on is on the uh, customer service and customer uh, engagement uh, component. So uh, companies increasingly recognize that in order to uh, provide the human touch and to build trust and inspire relationships and to keep persistent relationships, it's very important to have the human agent uh, uh, component uh, to preserve that and to maintain that. Uh, but at the same time, given the, the uh, volume of interactions, it is also necessary to scale and to uh, provide high quality responses consistently with very low latency. So uh, Agent IQ addresses this problem by uh, providing a hybrid platform which uh, has both the human co uh, agent component as well as the uh, artificial intelligence uh, machine-based component as well. So uh, this enables uh, companies to establish a persistent one-on-one -on -one relationship that inspires trust and loyalty with customers and uh, does it as, and the AI component ensures that this is being done at scale and uh, at uh, low latency and in a sustainable and consistent manner. So um, the, uh, as you can see here, the uh, one component is the AI-led component, which, we, uh, unfortunately, this slide was not updated, but we are, we are focused both on financial services and, and on logistics sector as well. So uh, when customers come in, the uh, high-frequency, low-value task uh, um, the, uh, queries are typically handled by the AI, and the, uh, there's a deep learning algorithm present in the system as well that is continuously learning from these interactions and enriching its own database. Um, so, the, uh, over time, the AI component is able to ha address most of the queries, and typically about 80% of queries are uh, basic uh, Q&A and very simple uh, queries, but they occur with a very high frequency. So more and more, uh, once the AI is able to handle these responses, it frees up the agents to actually handle uh, you know, the more complex, uh, high-value um, uh, interactions. So th there's also continuous interaction uh, and we have essentially three components as part of that interaction, what we call the concierge, courier, and the coach. So the concierge basically is the first level of interaction with the customer where the responses tend to be automated and uh, the system basically matches the intent and provides the uh, basic responses that uh, it's capable of doing uh, at the front end. The courier, uh, in, in case the machine is not able to handle uh, queries or the, the level of complexity uh, is beyond uh, the uh, it's uh, beyond the machine learning algorithms. It passes it on to agents and matches that intent uh, with the right agent who has the right level of expertise, has the capacity, and also has the availability at that given point. Uh, finally, given the rich abundance of data. The machine is constantly learning, and when the agent, human agent, is actually interacting with the customer, it pushes information that is contextual and that's relevant so that the agent is able to provide a much richer response uh, and is better equipped to uh, answer the uh, customer's query uh, in, in a very uh, valuable manner. 
So uh, this basically serves uh, two, uh, the advantages here are twofold. One is that the low value tasks, uh, the, uh, the agents are freed up from having to uh, continuously spend time on the lower value and less satisfying interactions, thereby their customer, or their employee satisfaction metrics are uh, over time are uh, uh, getting, uh, they increase. And in addition, uh, the agents are now able to uh, focus more on uh, the higher value tasks and this actually frees up time for them to engage in, uh, to identify potential upselling and cross-selling opportunities as well. I'll skip to this slide given the... So, uh, to summarize, basically, uh, the... The Agent IQ's platform allows agents to establish a persistent one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with, uh, relationship with customers, and at the same time, our AI and deep learning um, uh, algorithms enable these relationships to work at scale and at a very low latency. So we have a, a demo outside uh, in the exhibit hall, and we welcome you all to come in and take a look. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, and please, another a uh, round of applause for all of the presenters today and all the startups that you saw this morning. So we have now opened up the voting. So if you could please refer to the back of your badge, you will find a bit.ly address um, on the mobile. It should be on the front screen under voting. Um, SIM should be on the desktop as well. Um, so we're going to keep the voting open for the next five minutes. So please. Uh, Refer to your notes, think through some of the presentations that you've seen, and vote on which startups that uh, you know, were your favorites, either from a presentation point of view or from uh, their tech stack, et cetera. Uh, so now I'd like to turn it over to the managing director of the supply chain program, Farzine Shidpour, uh, to give a few words and to also talk about the Corporate Innovation Awards. Round of applause, please. Thank you, Harvey. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I hope that uh, you have enjoyed all these presentations and you have these. Uh, Great, very good. So, yes, is there success in the China market? So, yes, Chad is here. Uh, you are the startup winner. Everyone voted for you. So, congratulations. This is a gift. Thank you so much. Lunch is outside, uh, and feel free to network with the startups. They have their demo booth outside as well. <laughs> Supply chain team, let's take a team picture. <laughs> Mike, Alex.